Welcome to another edition of Lakeville City Council Wrap-Up. During this program, we will highlight the agenda items presented to the Lakeville City Council at their April 18th, 2016 meeting. First highlighted item on the agenda is item number 5B, Envision Lakeville Update. And to provide the background information on this agenda item is City Administrator Justin Miller. Mayor and Council and members of the public, you might remember that uh, in 2013, the city underwent a long-term strategic planning process called Envision Lakeville. And it's been our effort over the past year or so to try to make sure that that program does not become stale and to continually update the council on where we are and the status on that. And so tonight we're gonna give a brief presentation on where we are. Uh, so the Envision Lakeville process did set forth a vision for the future of Lakeville. And it also did uh, create a vision statement, which you'll see here. I'm not going to go through and read that word by word for you. It did also establish eight community values, diversified economic development, good value for public services, safety throughout the community, design that connects the community, high quality education, a home for all ages and stages of life, a sense of community and belonging, and access to a multitude of natural amenities and recreational opportunities. And what I think is uh, especially appropriate about this plan is that it, um, it did set out goals in specific time frames and so that it did keep us on our toes and try to address those. And those are done in um, five or 10 year increments and we're currently in the one to five year plan. And so tonight I'm gonna go through the key initiatives that we have listed there and just give you a little bit of an update on where we might be on some of those. The first one we're gonna talk about is increased economic sustainability. And one of the benchmarks under there was that we wanted to provide a broad range of financial incentives to attract businesses that employ higher skilled high wage jobs. And I think we've done an excellent job of that over the past year. So we provided $2.2 million in, in economic incentives and leveraged an additional $1.8 million in state funding. And that helped provide more than $23 million in development in, in just the, res in the commercial and industrial areas specifically. Those businesses alone have created 58 new jobs with a goal of another 127. And with that, post-consumer brands, which took over the mom brands facility, has added just in the year that they've um, come to Lakeville, 86 new jobs. And so that has been a, a very good success, uh, success, success story. Excuse me. Something that is uh, part of economic sustainability and trying to drive that would be supporting an, an aggressive transportation program. And that's what we're doing here. The, and anybody who knows, and there's a lot of people here tonight that are, know we're gonna have a pretty aggressive transportation program. The three I wanna highlight right now are the ones that are specifically what we think helping drive some economic generation, economic development generation. The first of which is improvements at Dodd Boulevard and Pilot Knob Road. That's where the high V is being constructed right now. We're improving that intersection to um, accommodate that, uh, that increase in traffic. Uh, we are currently in the plans and talking with landowners and and neighboring properties about the, installing a, a pretty short segment of road on 172nd Street at County Road 5. That's where home furniture and holiday in the Perkins area. Um, like I said, it's a short segment of road, but it really is gonna update that area and, and allow it for a lot more development. And then finally, something that we've been talking about for several years that is um, a couple years out still is the reconstruction of County Road 50 or Kenwood Trail from 185th to Dodd Boulevard. And there's several long, to tong, long time local businesses in that corridor that we've been really working with to try to preserve and, and improve their access. Something that I think is unique to a city plan, a city long range plan, is that we identify that quality education within the city is, is important. And so as such, we have said we wanted to collaborate on conversations related to developing and sustaining an educational system. Unfortunately, um, with the news that everybody's heard, Part of what goes on, the relationships between a city and a school district is security. And so our police department has done district-wide training with them uh, on various things, especially active shooters, and done tabletop exercises. And also with that, there was a recognition that the lockdown drills needed to change, and our Lakeville Police Department has really been helpful with that. We want to develop collaborative marketing uh, with the cities and the schools and the business community. And as such, our fire department is working with a marketing class with Lakeville North High School. And so there's the connection to quality education on um, how to better recruit and market the, the fire department because they're always in the need of, of new firefighters. And we want to work with the schools to leverage our common constituencies. And so as such, uh, later on tonight, you'll have an amendment to a conditional use permit to allow the MNCAPS program 
which is a joint program between the Lakeville Schools and Prior Lake to occupy space in the Minnesota School of Business. And we continue to work on the projects identified in the School Road Safety Task Force report, including Dodd Boulevard in front of Lakeville North, which that road just closed today. So action is moving there as well. We also like to develop a community of choice, and we would like to identify partnerships to, to increase housing choices. And the City Council did just recently have a work session, a couple work sessions, and identified ways that that might be possible. You'll also be reviewing a plan tonight called Argonne Fields that um, it could also elaborate and go into this. Uh, it's PUD style twin, twin homes. And then we want to analyze our park designs and facilities to, um, to address the changing trends and demographics in our community and the Parks, Rec, and Natu Natural Resources Committee. They've been touring all of our parks and we've been establishing what we think are more unique parks, including Ritter Farm Dog Park. And there are some plans for some other unique parks throughout the system as well. We want to cultivate a sense of community, and a lot of these within the next one to five year goals are centered around our downtown. We spend a lot of time talking about that. Staff is working with the Downtown Lakeville Business Association on a plan to replace all the sidewalks and the streetscaping along Holyoke, and that'll be done in 2017. Uh, likewise, we've been considering some special zoning development standards. Uh, some examples most recently were the change to allow some uh, changes in patio hours, as well as brew pubs, two of which are under construction and downtown. And we also wanted to create a plan to expand our community events. Uh, the Pan of Prague uh, this summer is our 50th, so if it wasn't big enough, it's going to be even bigger this summer. And the liquor department, along with um, the Lakeville Lions, as part of Pan of Prague, is looking to renew the brew battle, which will be a craft beer tasting event, and the proceeds from that are planned to go toward the land of amazement. And services that add value, uh, this is the last one we're going to be talking about. Uh, you know, we like to benchmark ourselves and, and do, uh, find what best practices are out there. And as such, the state auditor every year looks at the municipal liquor operations throughout the state. And in 2014, which is the last year that data is available for, uh, Lakeville Liquors was the highest in gross sales, net income, net transfers to the general fund, that is, and had the lowest operating expenses of all other municipal liquor stores. And so I think that's something to be very proud of. And also adding the value is our fire department added a duty crew program. So that means their station is staffed during the day when our, our coverage time was, was the hardest to provide coverage for. And that is it decreased the response time during those daytime calls from eight minutes to, down to three. And so that's been a great value add to the community. Um, as such, we want to measure our performance. The city is, in, um, uh, is now participating in the International City Management Association performance management program. Staff is in the process of collecting the data as part of that. It will not only allow us to track our own data over a period of time, but measure us against similar cities to see how we might be doing in that regard. And then also we do modify our service levels and expectations um, when needed. Uh, the, the police department as going through the compliance check program, the licensing programs through our alcohol licensing determined that the training provided by the businesses a lot of times surpassed the training that we could provide. And so we recognized that and changed ordinance to allow for that. And then the police department also formed a traffic safety committee that works across city departments to address traffic concerns so that um, all of our departments are on the same page in addressing those, especially when it comes to, reconstru or to construction projects. Just wanted to remind the community that this was not just a a city hall project, but there was a significant input from the residents, and this was the task force, and so we continue to appreciate and to thank them for this. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Just a note that the full report can be found on our website, lakevillemn.gov, or if you'd like a hard copy, you could give us a call, and we can make sure you get that. Next highlighted item on the agenda is item number eight, public hearing to consider proposed assessments for the 2016 street reconstruction project. And to give the information regarding this agenda item is Operation and Maintenance Engineer, Monica Heil. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. As you're now familiar, uh, the 2016 street reconstruction project includes about 8.4 miles of streets proposed to be reconstructed, uh, generally speaking, along the County Road 50 corridor. 
Uh, the project itself began uh, back in 2014 when we held our first neighborhood meeting with residents to discuss the project. Following that neighborhood meeting, the City Council authorized the preparation of a feasibility report, at which time some additional soil boring information was taken. And uh, following those soil borings, uh, we had a second neighborhood meeting with residents in June of 2015 to discuss the scope of the project and the work that would be completed uh, as it related to some of the findings from those soil boring reports. The feasibility report was completed last fall and a public hearing was held for the project back in November of 2015. After that meeting, we prepared plans and specifications, bid the project on March 4th, and declared cost to the City Council at its March meeting. We held our third neighborhood meeting for residents of the project area last Monday night. We had about 90 residents and business owners attend that meeting. Within the project, we are proposing some water main replacement work uh, within the South Fork commercial area as well as the South Fork Village townhomes. It is proposed to completely replace the existing iron water main within that area of the project with plastic water main. The reason is due to a break history and the corrosive soils found in the area. Uh, the soils uh, are clay and are corrosive to iron pipe, so that is why we were replacing it with plastic pipe, uh, which will not be adversely impacted by the, by the clay soils that we have. Along with the water main replacement, we'll also be replacing all of the hydrants in the area and services leading into businesses. The street improvements throughout the project will vary uh, largely due to utility needs. We've looked for opportunities to couple complete street com reconstruction with utility replacement needs, and we've defined seven different areas within the project uh, based on varying scopes and different methods for calculating unit assessments. Area A is 175th Court, uh, that is a cul-de-sac off of County Road 50 that has uh, the Dairy Queen pictured there. Within 175th Court, we'll be replacing all of the pavement section, replacing all of the curb and gutter and aprons leading into the businesses, and also installing corrosion protection to extend the useful life of the existing water main in the area, but not completely replace it. Area B of the project is the South Fork commercial area, and that area, due to the water main break issue that one just occurred last fall, uh, we will be replacing all of the existing iron water main with plastic water main as a part of the project. In addition, we'll be installing some additional storm sewer enhancements and drain tile to address some localized drainage issues. Concrete curb and gutter and driveway aprons leading into all the business in this, businesses in this area, excuse me, will also be replaced. Area C of the project is uh, made up of a portion of the South Fork Village townhomes. Again, we are proposing to completely replace all of the water main in this part of the project. In addition, we'll be completely reconstructing the street, replacing all of the curb and gutter, and adding some storm sewer enhancements uh, to address some localized drainage issues. Area D is also a part of the South Fork Village townhomes, but in this particular area, due to a lack of water main maintenance and break histories, we are not proposing to replace the water main. Instead, we'll be installing corrosion protection to extend the useful life of the water main and reconstruct the street. We will only be spot replacing concrete curb and gutter. Uh, that is only replacing those panels that are broken or otherwise heaved or holding water uh, and leaving those panels that are still functioning in place. Area E of the project is generally defined as the urban street sections. And when we refer to urban street sections, those are streets that have existing concrete curb and gutter. Again, we'll only be replacing those concrete curb and gutter panels that are heaved, settled, or otherwise broken, but we will be completely reconstructing the street sections. In addition, we'll be installing corrosion protection to extend the useful life of the water main. And when we look at Area E, uh, it is those streets showing in your uh, map there highlighted in red. It's those streets east of County Road 50 and some of those uh, streets just north of the Lake Marion area that constitute the urban street sections. We also have a number of rural street sections that exist within the project area and we are proposing to have those remain rural once work is done. Uh, within those areas, we are proposing to completely reconstruct the street section, uh, but rather than install new concrete curb and gutter everywhere, we'll be replacing the existing bituminous curb that currently exists and installing concrete curb and gutter only where it's necessary to facilitate drainage improvements. Now those streets that we are referring to as rural street sections are those highlighted in yellow and are those streets either adjacent to or very near to North Lake Marion. 
And when we look at these areas, we are also proposing some storm sewer enhancements, uh, specifically to address water quality entering into Lake Marion. A uh, number of these streets have direct discharges into the lake. We will be installing water quality manholes that will help to trap the sediment and allow public works staff to remove sediment prior to entering into Lake Marion. In addition, we'll be installing corrosion protection on the water main system to extend the useful life of those utilities. And finally, we have area G of the project, which is uh, Cabot Cove Lane. Due to the age of the pavement and the existing pavement condition, we are recommending only mill and overlay improvements to this particular street. Uh, that is, we'll remove the top layer of pavement, replace that, and perform some spot curb and gutter uh, repair work within the area in addition to the corrosion protection, but we will not be completely removing the street section as a part of this project. When we look at the projected costs for the project, the feasibility report estimate last fall estimated the project costs at $12.9 million. Uh, once we bid the project, the final project costs were determined to be $12.1 million, which was about a 6.4% reduction from the original estimate. When we look at the financing and the, and the project costs, uh, as a result of this lower than expected bid price, we do see a reduction in all of the funds that are contributing to the financing of this project. Uh, one thing I'll draw your attention to is the very bottom line there, uh, the trunk storm sewer fund. When we initially prepared the feasibility report for the project, we did not identify any trunk storm sewer funds contributing to the project. However, many of the water quality manholes that are being installed as a part of the project do serve a more regional purpose, and rather than specially assess for those improvements, the city's trunk storm sewer fund will be paying for those improvements wholly. The city's assessment policy is to specially assess those benefiting property owners 40% of the street and storm sewer improvements. Water main and sanitary improvements that will be completed as a part of the project are not assessed. Our trunk funds will pay for those improvements to the city's water and sanitary sewer system. The city's assessment policy also guides that assessments are calculated on a per unit basis for property zoned for single family use. That is to say that every single family unit within a specific project area receiving the same type of improvements pays the same assessment amount. The reasoning behind that is that every single family home generates the same amount of traffic as its neighbor. And rather than calculate based on frontage, we calculate it on a per unit basis. Duplex and townhomes, according to the city's assessment policy, are assess assessed one half of a single family unit. For those properties that are zoned commercially, such as area A and area B, those assessments are calculated on a per front foot basis. Corner lots are only assessed one unit. So if a property exists on a corner that has both of its street frontages being improved as a part of the project, they will only receive one unit assessment. And assessment uh, and lot assessments are typically determined by driveway location, house orientation, or past assessments. When we look at the proposed uh, or the estimated assessment amounts that were put together last fall and the bid results, uh, nearly every area of the project did see a reduction in the final assessment amount from what was estimated last fall with the exception of the South Fork Village townhomes. And those final assessment numbers were sent to residents in their letter announcing this special assessment hearing. The city does hold a hearing prior to construction such that no uh, unforeseen costs associated with the project are then added to any proposed, or excuse me, to any assessment bills. This is the final assessment amount regardless of what is determined with construction. The assessment period is 20 years, and the assessment interest rate will be 4.5%. Assessments can be paid without interest by November 15th of 2016. There are senior citizen and disabled persons deferral uh, options. Uh, I won't go through the list of things that would uh, cause for the deferral to end, but applications are available both on the project website and at the engineering counter at City Hall if there are any interested parties. Any applications for deferrals must be received by September 30th of this year. Assessments will be certified to the county in December of 2016, and the first payment will be due with taxes payable in 2017. Our assessment policy follows Minnesota State Statute 429 regarding public improvements in the special assessment process. Written intent to appeal must be presented in writing and signed by the property owner prior to or at this evening's hearing. Looking forward, we'll have the assessment hearing. Uh, following that assessment hearing, the city council will have the option uh, to consider awarding a contract for construction. Uh, should the council move forward with awarding the contract, construction would begin later this week in some portions of the project, weather permitting. Construction will continue through November of 2016 and assessments would be certified to the county in December of this year. 
We do have a preliminary phasing plan put together for the project. Generally speaking, the contractor would look to get on those streets located east of Kenwood Trail later this week to begin some of their improvements. Uh, this map is also available on the project website and will continue to be updated through construction as weather and construction uh, conditions may cause some changes in this map. The next steps would be for the City Council to hold the assessment hearing and then consider awarding a contract for the 2016 Street Reconstruction Project. Prior to that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Item number eight was approved by the Lakeville City Council. Next highlighted item on the agenda is item number nine, resolution calling a public hearing on proposed assessments for improvement project 16-04. And once again, to provide the background information on this agenda item is Operation and Maintenance Engineer, Monica Heil. Thank you. We authorized the feasibility report last fall, uh, worked on the feasibility report over the winter, and presented our findings to the City Council early this year. A public hearing was held for the project on February 1st. Plans and specifications were prepared, and bids were received on April 1st. Street improvements include the reclamation of the existing roadway section as well as some minor utility repairs. A new street section will be installed as a part of the improvements to address some of the pavement rutting and degradation of the edge of the roadway that has occurred in this area. In addition, some shoulder ro uh, rehabilitation work will be completed as a part of the project where a number of the trucks hauling in this area have caused the side of the existing shoulder to degrade. The feasibility report estimate for the project was $416,535,000. Based on the bid we received, the project costs are estimated or finalized at $324,180, which was a 22% reduction. We saw uh, very favorable bids, a number of bidders. It was bid as a late season project to uh, await the completion of some of the improvements taking place at the interstate property. And so uh, we got very good response on this particular bid letting. Based on the original estimates, uh, property taxes and special assessments were funding the improvements, and both of those uh, funding shares have been re reduced by 22% based on the bid that we did receive. The front foot assessment rate was originally estimated at $33.76, and based on the bid result, has been reduced to $26.28. Special assessments are proposed to be considered at a separate hearing on May 16th of this year. Uh, similar to the street reconstruction project, assessments for this project can be paid without interest by November 15th of this year, and it is again a 20-year assessment period. Looking forward, uh, after we declare the costs and set the assessment hearing tonight, we would propose to hold that assessment hearing in May. The council would then have the option to award a construction contract at that same meeting. Uh, construction would commence in August or September of this year, uh, depending on the timing of the completion of the work at the interstate parcel. Once that gets going, uh, construction will be completed in September or October, and assessments would be certified to the county in December of this year. Next steps, the council has a resolution before them calling for a public hearing on the proposed assessments for City Improvement Project 1604. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Item number nine was approved by the Lakeville City Council. Next highlighted item on the agenda is item number 10, Aragon Fields. And to give the background information regarding this agenda item is Director of Planning, Daryl Morey. We'll start with the location of the preliminary plat, uh, which is at the very south end of Janelle Path. Uh, it's behind, if you will, the Argonne Cub Foods and the Argonne Commercial Development. And the proposal is for 20 twin home lots and it's on 9.66 acres. The subject property is currently uh, guided and zoned for low density residential, i.e. single family residential uses. Uh, the developer is proposing a couple of applications in conjunction with the preliminary plat, including a comprehensive plan amendment to re-guide the property from low density residential to low medium density residential, and then also a rezoning to um, or a zoning map amendment to rezone the property to PUD from the current RS2 single family residential district and looking for a couple of flexibilities in terms of the PUD rezoning. This is a layout of the preliminary plat, a nice 
colored drawing, which was not done by me. That's why it looks so good. Um, the, uh, as you can see, the access for the uh, twin home buildings in this particular development will be from a private drive off of the end of the Janelle Path cul-de-sac. Uh, private drives are allowed uh, in the RM1 district. That's the district we use as the base for the planned unit development. Uh, but the number of units off of the private drive exceeds what the RM1 district uh, standards would allow. So that is a flexibility that's being requested by the developer uh, as part of the PUD. And also um, in terms of setbacks from the private drive, uh, they're requesting a 25 foot setback from the private drive. The RM1 standard is 30. Uh, 25 feet still is sufficient to allow the parking of a vehicle in the driveway in front of the garage without overhanging and impacting the private street surface. And then uh, setback flexibility between buildings. Uh, the RM1 standard is 25 feet. The developer is requesting 20 feet and that would be for these units here along the south side. Uh, if you recall, the city council approved an amendment to the zoning ordinance last month to, that reduced the setback for detached townhomes in the RST2 district down to 14 feet uh, and, and the twin homes here would be something fairly similar, similar. so staff feels that the 20-foot uh, setback for those particular buildings along the south side to be appropriate. And the main reason for the flexibilities is because of the environment of this parcel of land. The proposal, um, again, to re-guide this for low medium density residential and to have these twin home units as you heard to be marketed for basically for empty nesters and seniors certainly is a, a housing product that would meet the city's life cycle housing goals of the comprehensive plan. Now the five units per acre that is part of the staff report that you see is a, based on the net density and that's because the wetland which is basically this whole southerly over half of the property uh, takes the density down. If you were looking at it from a gross density standpoint, it'd be only about two units per acre. But because that area comes out of the net density calculation, that's how you get to the five units per acre. And since you have a parcel of land that really only has the northerly portion that's developable and uh, the constraints that you have, again, with the wetlands and topography, uh, staff uh, felt it was appropriate and supported the flexibilities that are proposed by the developer as part of this PUD. And the design uh, that was chosen uh, was reviewed and discussed with staff uh, uh, under sev um, several um, sketch plan iterations. There was uh, consideration of the possibility of making a street connection to the east, but given the grades that are out there in the short uh, distance that you would have to punch that street through uh, from Janelle Path to the east. It was de deemed to be unfeasible uh, in terms of uh, meeting city standards for street uh, percentage, grade percentage. Just a little bit, uh, a quick history. The property uh, a long time ago when I was first uh, planner here was actually zoned com uh, commercial and had been zoned commercial for quite some time. Back in 1998, uh, there was a consideration to rezone the property and a couple of the properties to the north from commercial to low density residential and that's where the R2 or RS2 now uh, category uh, comes into play and that's been rezoned since 1998. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, wetland buffer, wetland and wetland buffers comprise about five acres of this uh, 9.66 acre site. Um, there is a small uh, portion of right of way of Janelle Path that's requested to be vacated. Uh, that's not before you this evening. That resolution will come forward in conjunction with the final plat if the city council indeed approves this preliminary as presented. Um, also, as part of that discussion, uh, we had a conversation looking at possible um, pedestrian connections to the Argonne um, Village commercial area, and because of the uh, narrow access points and steep slopes on the west side of that roadway, 
uh, we are going to study closer with the final plat the possibility of doing a striped on street um, pedestrian area on the west side of Janelle. It is a uh, wider than typically uh, street section for a cul-de-sac. So there is some room to do that and not impact the driving surface of that roadway. The uh, Planning Commission held a public hearing on the preliminary plat and the comp plan and zoning map amendments at their April 7th meeting uh, and unanimously recommended approval of the requests. There was public comment from one neighboring property owner at that meeting. The Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources Committee also recommended approval unanimously of the preliminary plat at their meeting on April 6th. Staff is recommending approval of the preliminary plat, the comp plan amendment, the PUD rezoning ordinance, and adoption of the findings of fact. And I can stand for questions. Item number 10 was approved by the Lakeville City Council. Well, those were the highlighted items presented to the council at their April 18th, 2016 meeting. If you have any questions or comments regarding these agenda items, please feel free to call City Hall. The number is 952-985-4400. Thanks for watching this edition of Lakeville City Council Wrap-Up. The Lakeville Rotary presents the annual Taste of Lakeville at the Lakeville Area Art Center on Thursday, May 19th from 5 to 9 p.m. Enjoy food samples from area restaurants as well as wine and beer tasting galore, plus live music and silent auctions. Tickets are $35 in advance or $45 at the door. Proceeds benefit local scholarships and community projects. Check out event details at tasteoflakeville.org.